we stopped at verse 10, chapter 2. We continue now with verse 11. So, the blessed Lord said, You are grieving. Yeah, we can. <laughs> yes. We can, we can green yet. Ah. We cannot see the screen. Ah. Good, Next. good, good. Good you remind me. <laughs> better? I think you should be able to see it now. Yes, oh. that's better. Thank you. Okay, no. But I have a little thing here. Just a minute. Mm. Okay. And, all right. So that should be better. So the blessed Lord said, you are grieving about those over whom one should not grieve. And yet you are speaking words of pretended wisdom. The wise do not grieve about those who are yet breathing, nor about those who have ceased to breathe. So, with verse 11, chapter 2, Sri Krishna has now started the actual teachings of the Bhagavad Gita. He has now dived in and he goes straight to the point and he says, right there, you are speaking words of pretended wisdom. What is he referring to? What does he mean by pretended wisdom? We saw in chapter 1 as well as the first few, first few verses of chapter 2 that Arjun came up with very many convincing arguments why he should not fight. And some of those arguments were extremely convincing, such as killing my gurus is a terrible thing, that cannot possibly be right or uh, we should not fight because uh, we need to preserve society and tradition and so there are so many good arguments that for any normal person these seem to be extremely good arguments for not fighting and he says, Sri Krishna says, this is your pretended wisdom. This is coming from intellectual knowledge, book knowledge. It is feigned wisdom. Very often this happens to seekers, to meditators who come to yoga and they come with certain ideas that yoga is peace. And sure, certainly it does lead to greater inner peace. But eventually, only when you have resolved certain issues that have to be resolved. But we use all these arguments to avoid the real battle. We use our learning, our book knowledge. We even quote great teachers, masters. And we say, we find arguments that suit our convenience. That's why we need a guide or a teacher. Because otherwise, we with our poor understanding of scriptures, misunderstand them and misuse them. This pretended knowledge <clears throat> or book knowledge comes from misunderstanding. We become fatalist in our approach. These teachings are far from fatalistic. They give us a tremendous power. They empower us so that we can take our own destiny, fate in our hands. 
we can become architects of our own future, of our own lives. But unfortunately, many people read certain scriptures and they come to wrong conclusions. They think acceptance means whatever happens, I have to accept it. This becomes very fatalistic in approach. So very often, due to this misunderstanding, they suffer a lot more. Certain misunderstandings have taken place which come out of the fact that the certain ideas like Ahimsa, for example, is taken as an excuse, okay, not to kill animals and hmm, there's some disturbance and I don't know quite where that's coming from, but I presume it's coming from Shanta. Shanta, uh, you need to go on mute. Is that oh, possible? All right, I'll yes. do that, yeah. Yes, yeah. Because we get some sort of, you know, uh, background noise when you're still on. All right. So, the understanding of Ahimsa, for example, we understand it from our own perspective and we think of it as Ahimsa means don't kill animals or don't kill plants or, you know, life. There is a much deeper understanding that we, we need to have. And that is Ahimsa can become a rule. But if we think of this as Advaita, that all life all creatures have a soul, even the humblest little ant, you know, a small little ant or little insect also has a soul, has an Atman. You begin to see they also have life. They also have the same life in them as you have. And that is not different from your, you, the, the Atman you have is essentially the same. It's the same nature. When you have this direct knowledge or direct realization in you, you will become non-violent. You will become non-violent because you will not want to kill other life forms. You will have a tremendous respect for these other life forms. It is not then a mere rule that you impose on yourself. It is out of deep respect for life forms that ahimsa becomes a natural part of you and your life. So it is these kind of misunderstandings, readings of the scripture without guidance that is referred to here. He says to Arjun, you seem to be speaking words of wisdom, but these are not words of wisdom. It sounds wise what you're saying, but in reality, if we examine what he's saying, as we have been doing in the last sessions, we see that in fact, he has become fatalistic, he's defeated, he's not even willing to start on this battle, he sees all his negative qualities in him. The task seems to be so overwhelming that he is unable to continue. And he uses all these nice lines, you know, and arguments as excuse. He refers, Sri Krishna refers to the breathing as well as those who have ceased to breathe. The wise do not grieve over those who are yet breathing and those who have ceased to breathe. Why does he use this kind of construction? Why doesn't he say those who are alive and those who are dead? Because with this, he is dived directly into the very heart of spiritual wisdom. 
which is pure consciousness, Atman. If you are Atman, you can never die. You can cease to breathe, but you don't die. So why do you grieve for those who are not breathing? He doesn't say, why do you grieve over those who are dead? Because you do not really die. So right here, he begins the highest teachings. The teachings of Advaita. When we ended our last session, Joachim had asked whether this is a dualistic text. And right here, you get your answer. It is not a dualistic text. It is much better than that. It is both. It is dualistic as well as non-dualistic. It combines the fact that we need to live in this dualistic world. We have our dualities. We have the positive qualities and the negative qualities in us and around us in our environment. And yet there is that one eternal part in us, the part that never dies. So, we have both. And so this is one of those amazing texts which combine both. It is known as Advaita Dvaita. That means Advaita as well as Dvaita. Non-dualistic as well as dualistic. Both. He goes on to elaborate this. Uh, yes, somebody said something? Yeah, I think this is a good example here that you actually need um, an explanation of the text, otherwise uh, you would not see that here, that this embraces Advaita here, this sentence. Yes, it, it embraces both. He says, don't grieve about those who are breathing, who are in this dualistic world, as well as those who have ceased to breathe. They are, they are not dead. They are very much there. The, the Atmans are there, the Jeev Atmans are there. They have merely ceased to breathe. So it combines both. He elaborates now further. In verses 12 and 13. There never was a time indeed when I was not nor you, nor these rulers of people, nor shall we all from this moment on ever cease to be. As in the body of this body bearer, Atman, there is childhood, youth and old age, so there occurs the transfer to another body. A wise one does not become confused in this matter. So, there are so many interesting, amazing ideas touched upon in just these two short verses. It's very profound and very rich. So there never was a time when I was not, nor you. That means we have always been. Not in this form, but we have always been. And we shall never cease to exist. So we shall continue to exist. In what form is that? Consciousness. Consciousness, or Atman, will always be. And it, it never dies. It is eternal. It was never born. It never dies. It's always going to be there. It just takes different forms. Why, why does he actually say here from this moment, why is there a timely cut is there any significance to that? Because if it's always there, then why only from this moment? That might have to do with the translation. Let me have a look. No, from the translation, that does not seem to be there. Um, you know, this is the issue with translations, is that... Um, cannot be literal and 
they are transliterated so that it makes sense in English, so that it is not clumsy or very literal or very direct. So sometimes there is a little bit of, you know, some sort of floral language coming in to make it sound a bit nice. After all, the Sanskrit version is poetry, it's verse. So sometimes these things do creep in, but there is no particular significance to that. It is merely that we have always been and we shall never cease to be. Mm -hmm. That is, of course, another reason why I'm working on a translation, uh, keeping this in mind, N not the focus on the fine, flowery language, but the focus on the teachings and having a translation that's easy to read and sticks really to the uh, spirit of the words, you know, the meaning of the words as far as possible. There are many translations, so, you know, one needs to uh, find the balance. In verse 13, he elaborates on that and says, This body is, a, is the body of the body bearer. Who is the body bearer? Who is the owner of the body? The owner is Atma. The body is being born or is is, is, is uh, been carried, you know, that's why he uses body bearer, has been carried by Atman. It is the Atman which is carrying this body. And this body goes through childhood, youth and old age. And then there's a transfer to another body. So, right here, he's talking about reincarnation. One who is wise does not become confused in this matter. Now, I think that's pretty clear that a lot of people um, say we do not believe in incarnation, reincarnation, we do not really know if it is true or not. And um, you see that this is um, not really a matter of belief. So people say, I don't believe or I believe. Do you believe in reincarnation? People ask me and I say... I d no, I don't believe in it. I know it. And that comes from certain experience in meditation, through the process of contemplation. If we contemplate on ourselves and on the world and surroundings, we see that there must be something that is permanent. Because everything else in the world is transient and changing. But there is something permanent, which is eternal. And then you come to the conclusion, yes, that, that there must be something like reincarnation because people also have memories of different lifetimes. When there is that direct experience, there is no more confusion in this matter. So the wise man does not become confused. The discussions, the, there are many studies about reincarnation. There have been people who have reported about their past lives. Those reports have been confirmed. The stories that they told have been confirmed. So there have been many studies about this. And yet, people say, I don't know. I'm not sure. But understandable. There is a confusion in this matter. But these two paragraphs here, uh, two verses here, are absolutely, very clearly non-dualistic in nature. This is a clear statement of pure consciousness is eternal. It takes different forms. The body goes through different phases, is reborn. Nothing is really lost. And when we really have that direct insight, when we have a deeper understanding of this matter, then we do not grieve 
for those who are dying or grief for those who have passed. So is there anybody who would like to ask anything about this? Or I can move on to the next ones. Yes. Balaji here. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned about the uh, fatalistic approach towards accepting certain things, uh, whatever comes in life. Uh, could you please explain that logical? I, I could not really get that point. That was with reference to the earlier verse where Sri Krishna says to Arjun. All the things you have said so far, they sound wise, but this is pretended wisdom. Those ideas that he talked about, you know, society, tradition, gurus, these are ideas that we all know. Yes, of course, we should respect our teachers. Yes, of course, it, it's important uh, that society is... Um, the traditions of society are preserved, that humankind carries on, that knowledge does not die out. Of course, these are all well and true. But this is not deeper wisdom. This is just based on knowledge, information. Carrying on of a tradition or society is based on knowledge. This is not... Um, Spiritual wisdom. You know, there is the difference between Padavidya and Vidya, uh, Aparavidya. Uh, In one, is all about learning skills, how to maybe earn your living, you know, learning skills for a profession. It's very important, this kind of learning, this kind of knowledge. We read from books, we get knowledge about, for example, even scriptures. Or we get knowledge about, we want to make a, a, a dish, you know, we want to cook something and you just, today you can look in the internet and get yourself a recipe. Well, that's also knowledge, you know, that's information. And these things are important for our society. We are using computers, laptops, all this technology it was not coming from one person suddenly from nowhere. It has been built up over decades, built on, in fact, the knowledge thousands of years ago based on numbers, based on the inventions of zero and the binary numbers. And from that came the whole knowledge of computing eventually, mathematics and then computing. And therefore, today we can have these online meetings. And I can speak to, to people from different parts of the world. Why and how did that happen? It happened because that knowledge was transferred, handed down over thousands of years. So we see value in that. There's no doubt there is value in that. But that's not all. There's a deeper wisdom. And that deeper wisdom is that spiritual knowledge. It has nothing to do with the preserve, preservation of society. And when we do not understand this, we acquire just some rules of how to live and so that our society is not disturbed, so that we are well-balanced members of society. We misunderstand these teachings because we don't have guidance then it happens that we, we have a fatalistic idea of these teachings. We think, yes, let's all be peaceful. It's not about being peaceful. True spiritual teachings is about getting to know yourself. True spiritual wisdom is about verses 12 and 13, knowing that you are not your body and that this body will age but that pure consciousness in you will never die. You have always been and you will always be. That's true spiritual wisdom. Not just at an intellectual level, but at a 
practical level, with the direct understanding, it will empower you. Very often, people read this, we call them new Advaitites. They, are, they love the philosophy of Advaita. It's beautiful, non-dualistic philosophy. It is, says, you are Atman, you are pure consciousness. But you begin to use this in a way that is making it into intellectual philosophy. You're not able to integrate it. So if you have a problem, instead of resolving it, you simply say, oh, I'm not consciousness, uh, sorry, I'm not body, I'm pure consciousness. It doesn't matter. You do not want to resolve those problems. So this is what I mean by fatalism. You don't have to accept things. You are living in the dualistic world. Remember, that's why I said the beauty of this is it is both dualistic as well as non-dualistic, this text. Which means you do have to live in this world as long as you have this body. You are the body bearer, but you have this body. You will go through childhood, you will go through youth and old age. So you will have to live in this world. In our tradition, we often talk about this in a very, very interesting manner. We, we don't refer to it as Advaita and Dvaita. We don't talk about it as dualism and non-dualism because these words can get very intellectual. So we say, you live in two worlds. You are the citizen of two worlds, the internal world and the external world. The laws of the internal world are different from the laws of the external world. When you're in the external world, you need to deal with situations. You cannot tell people, oh, I'm Atman, I'm, I'm not going to do this, you know. You know, when you are in a job, you are employed, you have to do certain things. Some people have physical problems. They are sick. They need to take care of their bodies. What would happen if they would just say, Oh, I don't have to bother about my body. I'm Atman. That results in people who don't take care of their body. And then go through a lot of suffering. So we need to understand that this philosophy taken on its own, just Advaita can become very intellectual, can lead to tremendous amount of issues. But if it is combined together with the dualistic approach, both together, they are perfect. They complement each other. Sri Krishna continues to elaborate in verses 14 and 15. He says, The contacts between the elements, O son of Kunti, are the causes of heat, cold, pleasure and pain. Being non-eternal, these come and go. Learn to withstand them, O descendant of Bharata. O bull among men, the person to whom these do not cause any suffering, the wise man who is alike to pain and pleasure, he alone is ready for the immortal state. The contact between the elements here is very clearly the aspect of the senses and manas. We have our senses, we are living in this world, we have a body, so we will experience heat, cold, pleasure, pain, all these dualities. And as we experience all these dualities, 
we experience them as suffering. This heat, cold, pleasure, pain, these dualities are experienced as suffering. But they are non-eternal, they come and they go. They are all transient. Now the line says learn to withstand them. It's again one of those uh, translation issues. Um, the Sanskrit says titiksha, uh, that means to be above. So he says be above these. Be like a lotus. Lotus that grows in, a, in muddy waters. Be like that lotus that is in the muddy waters yet above. So don't be affected by these dualities. Now, when you read this, then immediately the thought is, oh, I should not be affected by it. I have to be very stoic. And so we use basically our ahankara to in a sense say okay I have to tolerate this withstand this and that's a misreading of the scriptures he says these contacts are there they will always be there be like a lotus he explains in the next verse verse 13 how shall you be above these? Not by pretending that you, you are not suffering. Not by pretending that, that the pain is not bothering you or the, the, the cold is not bothering you or the heat is not bothering you. All these dualities, we are being affected by them all the time because we have a body and we live in this world. So, how is it that we can go beyond it? The person to whom these do not cause suffering who is alike to pain and pleasure, he alone is ready for the immortal state. Well, who would be like that? There can be only one kind of being that is like that. And that is one who is able to witness. He becomes a witness. So, Radhikari, where is the you know, the boundary between uh, ahinsa and being above pleasure and pain, because it can very easily kind of descend into, uh, you know, a competition to withstand pain, that's which it. would be hinsa towards the self. But that's exactly what I said. It's not about yeah, learning know, to withstand pain. Practically, where is the boundary? I don't know what you quite mean by that, Ashish. Where is the boundary? Um, I, I understand. I, I'm just saying internally, uh, what is, I guess it's defined by the attitude towards the pain. No, uh, this is not about your attitude. It's not about your mental attitude. This, bear with me, it's it's not so easy, okay, to understand. So just, you'll have to bear with me. I'm, I'm okay. trying to uh, get there. It's, um, it, it's not about... The mind saying or the body saying, I am going to bear the suffering. It's about becoming or being, becoming is the wrong word, being a witness. The one who is a witness is not really of this world. As long as you go through these dualities, are attached, feel aversion, you will suffer. You, you may be stoic and try to withstand them, but that's not what he's saying. That's not what he's saying here. I know this, this line here, this is, that's why I brought your attention to it. There's not necessarily a good translation here. It's about being a lotus. You know, a lotus is not attempting to be a lotus. It's not trying to be a lotus. It is a lotus. So it's not about withstanding something or uh, you know going through something and that's where your question comes from where is the boundary of ahimsa you, of course if you would go through a lot of suffering you would say that may be a kind of form of violence against yourself 
I agree with you entirely. What this is, is being a witness. You are no longer of this world. You become an observer. You become a witness. You are not attached. We all know what a frog looks like. The frog is a very unusual symbol, just like the lotus, but the frog goes a little deeper. It's not a very attractive symbol. A lotus is far more beautiful, I think, aesthetically for most people. But the frog has very interesting qualities. Some of us who were in the mentoring program have already discussed this. But for everybody else's uh, information for, for everybody else, the frog begins its life as a tadpole. It's a very small little thing and it lives in the water. It's purely aquatic. It, it cannot survive outside. And it goes through a metamorphosis. It's a beautiful word. It means complete transformation. It goes through a life cycle which is quite fascinating for biologists, people who's, who, who are interested in plant, animal life. It's a very fascinating process. They go through a complete transformation to become frogs that are basically terrestrial animals. So from aquatic water-based life forms, they become land-based life forms. So it seems they go through this huge transformation within a few weeks or months. What life um, on Earth went through, you know, life on Earth was apparently uh, starting in, in the water and then eventually came onto land. So it's like fast forward. All that happens in the life of a tadpole transforming into a frog within a few weeks or a few months. And that is a tremendous transformation because if the water is a symbol of the world, it's a symbol of the three states of consciousness, all the three states of consciousness, waking, dreaming and deep sleep are water. That's the world. But when you're on land, you're dry, and the frog is often portrayed sitting near the pond, looking, in, looking at the water. He is a witness. He is sitting there on land, and he is witnessing. He has transformed. He is no longer in the worldly waters. He is on land. And that is why one of the most profound Upanishads of our tradition, the, Mun, the Man, Mandukya Upanishad, is the Frog Upanishad. Mandukya, Manduk, Mandak means frog. So the Upanishad takes its name from a frog. And this is the reason why, because you become a witness. The frog is the witness. He's witnessing the three states of consciousness. If you've not had a glimpse of that state, it is very difficult to understand that or to relate to this. That he's not talking about bearing pain, going through suffering. He's not talking about a form of tapas over here. That this is a purely non-dualistic chapter here, chapter 2. It is the core of the teachings. It's pure Advaita. And he's saying the one who is ready for that immortal state is the one who witnesses heat and cold, pain and pleasure, all as dualities. It's all part of life. It doesn't touch him because he's dry, he is on land, he is observing the waters, when occasionally he needs to dive in and go into the water, he can do that, 
He can do that to serve others. He can go into the muddy waters also for others. And so we say the internal and the external worlds have different laws. So we must learn to live in both the worlds. That would be the ideal state. If you can become a witness, you can live in both the worlds. You can jump into the water whenever you want. You can be a part of everything, but it will not touch you still. I don't know if that was useful, Ashish, but I hope that it made some sense. Uh, yeah, I, I think it's useful. Uh, I, I guess the mistake or whatever I was making was to see it as an instruction. So there's no kind of instruction at all. Yes, exactly. It's, that's that's a common mistake. You see it as an instruction. That's why I said, you know, I brought your, drew your attention to that and said, this is a translation issue here. And it's not an instruction. It is a description of yeah. the state of a witness. Yeah. And these are the, the, you know, the common misunderstandings. Yeah, and that makes all the difference. Yes, yeah. of course. The instructions come, they come later when the text becomes more practical. Chapter 2 is one of the longest chapters. It has got, I think, 72 verses in it. It's one of the longest chapters in the Bhagavad Gita and it goes quite fairly deep into the, the core, you know, of the teachings, the, the, uh, the part about this, this, the immortal part of us. And as I mentioned before we started chapter 2, that this is exactly the reason why it is read out to those who are dying. They get a feel of that eternal part within themselves. It's very profound and then in, in those moments it can be also very comforting. When the fear of dying is strong, when the, the loss of, from the perspective of the dying person, the loss of, of his near dear ones is, is uh, coming closer, this can be very, very comforting. But what is comforting I for just want... what is yeah. comforting for the person who is dying, of course, can be misunderstood by those who are living. <laughs> and for us, it is important that we also come eventually to the parts that are practical, and that comes from the, the following chapters. Yes, Joachim, you wanted to say it. Yeah, because you mentioned that a couple of times that the Bhagavad Gita actually is, the chapter 2 is read out to the dying. Yeah. And I just had this thought that, you know, in a way, while we are listening now, there's also a part in us dying, this old part of, you know, being attached to things. So maybe it can be even taken um, in that way that it's read out to those people who want to die from their habits and their attitudes. Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. I have mentioned very often that meditation is inherently a violent process. When you look at yourself, you look at your negative qualities, and when you set out on that battle wanting to sort of dismantle your own ahankara, it is a process very similar to dying. Those who go deeper into meditation experience tremendous amount of fear. And the fear they're experiencing is not because they think they're going to physically die. The fear they're experiencing is because of the misunderstanding that the, the ego has created. The ego has usurped the role of Atman. The ego says, I am Atman. If I die, you die. And that is the problem when people start meditating and the ego starts feeling attacked. And the ego has to be purified, which means basically unlearning those things and letting those false identities die. 
that is a process which is like death. So in a sense, meditation itself is a violent process, but it brings us to eternal life. So this, there's, there's beauty in it. So yes, very true that in a sense when we are reading this is because parts of us are also dying. Maybe a few years back you would have had no interest in reading books like this, like the Bhagavad Gita. You probably had no interest in yoga and you were just a regular person leading your normal life. Something happened that changed you and your approach to life and you got interested in this. So something that was there earlier died. And because that died, you are open to this. It's a new life. Which is why also one talks about being twice born when you are initiated. It's a new birth, it's a new beginning. So verse 16, that which is non-existent never comes into being. That which is existent never goes to non-being. The seers of reality have seen the very end of both of these. Know that as indestructible by which all this tangible world is permeated. No, uh, no one has the power to bring to destruction this unalterable entity. So once again, a uh, slightly more detailed explanation of the earlier verses. That which does not have a, have a, a which is not really existent, is never going to come into existence. Yeah, what doesn't exist doesn't exist. But what, what exists can not stop existing. If you think about it in terms of science, all the atoms and molecules in this universe are there. They're merely changing form all the time. It's not more or less. It's always the same. So it just takes form. What was not there is not there and will never be. And what is there will always be. Just takes a different form. We know this also from the famous formula, the world's most famous formula, E is equal to mc square, that energy can turn to matter and matter into energy. So basically we are all consciousness, for consciousness is energy. And we take different forms. And then we go back to energy, but we then again take another form. Nothing is lost in that. Very scientific, actually. Over here in verse 17, I would make this change that know that, that I would put in capitals, know that as indestructible by which all this tangible world is permeated. Know that as in that first, which comes from this very idea, the name that first, that being referred to here is pure consciousness. The that being referred to here has many names. Atman, Paraatman, Pure Consciousness, Shiva, Shakti, Mahatrapura Sundari. There are many names for it. <clears throat> Ultimately, because there are so many different names, one simply says that. So know that as indestructible by which all this tangible world is permeated. So even though this world is continuously changing, there's constant change, nothing is permanent, there seems to be an underlying 
reality that is constant. When you were a child, there was a part of you that knew you were you, right? You knew that this was, that's me. When you became a teenager, your body started changing. But there was something that was still you in there. As you became, became an adult, many of your ideas changed. Your whole approach to life changed. Your body changed anyway. But still, there was something which was constant. As you become old, your body will start deteriorating. Your body will start dying. Organs will start failing. Yet there will be something that is still you. You know it. So something is there in you that has not changed. Body changed, mind changed, your opinions changed, your ideas changed, feelings changed, emotion changed, your whole environment changed around you, the people in your life changed. Yet something remained constant. And that is what permeates the entire existence. And nobody has the power to destroy that unalterable entity. That pure consciousness is life itself. How can life die? Life itself can never die. <coughs> Sorry. Verse 18, belonging to the immeasurable, imperishable, eternal owner of the body. These bodies are said to be perishable. Therefore fight, O descendant of Bharata. So who is that eternal owner? Pure consciousness. We have just said, we have just proved that pure consciousness is imperishable. If you, we have analyzed the world around us and we have seen that something is always constant. Through these kind of contemplations we can come to that realization. Of course, eventually, when, when you become a witness, you know it. Or when you have a glimpse of samadhi, then you know it. Once you know that, nobody can convince you otherwise. There are no more doubts. This message, of course, comes at an intellectual level. And so at an intellectual level, you can convince yourself of it. But you may keep having doubts about it. But once you've had that direct insight, when you've gone through the whole process, then that's very clear. You are not of this world anymore. Your actions will be very different. From somebody external looking at you may not see any change. That is why we say there is no way you can really find out how a enlightened one is just by looking at the person. If you're witnessing, you know that you are the eternal owner of the body. The bodies are perishable anyway. Anyway they are bound to die. Same with the, the, all the samskaras which are in the mind. These also must die, so fight. So the message is you are at two levels. One is, of course, that don't give up 
this idea of meditation. Continue, look at yourself, examine your own qualities, become an observer, become a witness. And the other level is, of course, when you see everything as a witness around you, you will see all the time that everything is dying always and is being reborn always. Some of us may have seen or heard of this form of Shiva called Nataraja. It's that he dances the, the thunder, the th dance of destruction. And that is, in a sense, a very pictorial um, representation of what is happening in the world all the time. From the point of view of a physicist as well, all the atoms and molecules are going through a process of change all the time. There is all around us, even though the walls and, and the furniture and everything around you looks solid, it is still at this very moment going through change. Your very body, every cell is going through change. Did you know that all the cells in your body are renewed every seven years approximately? So approximately every seven years you actually have a new body. So why are you getting attached to the body? Why are you getting attached to all the things around you? Why are you getting attached to all the people? When you have that eyesight that you can see the world like Shiva's dance of destruction, then you see this continuous flux, this continuous change happening. And then you cannot be attached to any of that stuff because you see it, it is not permanent. So when you have that inside, that really when you see it, that's why it's called yoga darshan. Darshan means to see. It's not called yoga philosophy. It's not an intellectual thing. In translating, for a lack of a better word, people have started talking about yoga philosophy. But the word, actual word, Sanskrit says yoga darshan. Darshan means to see. We're not unfortunately able to find a, a really a, a good English word, you know, that conveys this idea that you need to see actually. You've got to have a different eyesight. Those who have that, they are said to have divya chakshu, divine eyes. In the following chapters, Arjuna gets those divine eyes from Krishna as grace in considerate Shaktipat, Sambhavi Diksha, where the obstacles are removed for a moment and he can see this amazing cosmic dance of destruction, which is perpetually happening all the time. And here he says, well, if everything is changing and you have that eyesight, you have this way of looking at the world, seeing this, then you will never get attached to these things. You will not get attached to all your relatives and your friends. You will only see that you have to do certain things and then you do it, your duty. All right, so maybe this is a good place to stop. If anybody would like to ask something, Radhika ji, yes. uh, I just, uh, I had no question, I just wanted to uh, say that your discussion about quantum information was very much helpful. Oh, thank you. Good, I'm glad. Yes. Good, so um, we continue um, next Friday and for those who are joining for the Pranayam meet, uh, we meet on Sunday, online, same time. So enjoy your weekend and uh, have a nice time. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Radhika. Thank you. Thank you.
Bye everybody. Bye. 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 Thank you very much, Radhika. Bye-bye. Bye, Rimke. -bye. Bye,